Good morning, Dr. Polo Norwita and fellow students. Today, Raymond Chen, Raym Kadori, Angeline Nathan, Ime Fernando, and myself, Harrison Fu of Group G, will be presenting our case study on white lesions. We will be covering patient details, our presenting complaints, and medical, dental, and social history. This will be followed by a discussion of our findings from the clinical photographs, the list of differential diagnosis, special tests and investigations, as well as the management plan. Mrs. HC is a 68 years old female patient of unknown ethnicity. She presents with a white lesion, first noticed approximately five months ago, with bleedings only on the gums. Other complaints include corrugated nails, which she hasn't done anything. Otherwise, Mrs. HC is fit and healthy, she has no relevant medical condition, is not taking any medications, and is not aware of any allergies. She does not smoke and consume alcohol only on rare occasions. She is a dentic patient without any abnormality in dentition. Systematic extraoral examination has found no abnormality pertaining to the lymph nodes, skin, and lips. No visible orofacial swellings infers absence of local acute or chronic inflammations. No palpable abnormalities of the lymph nodes infers the absence of infection in the head and neck region. Absence of cutaneous lesion and no visible or palpable abnormality of lips infer absence of focal anomaly. This is an intraoral clinical photograph of Mrs. Hacy showing the lips retracted with the patient's fingers. The photograph demonstrates the upper lip vermilion with residue lipstick, maxillary and mandibular dentition, lower labial mucosa, inferior labial frenulum, and anterior labial gingivite. Also evident is a small bruise on her left thumb and appearance of corrugated nails, which may be identified as only cohesic. It should be noticed that while nail changes can simply be a sign of advanced age, they can also occur with peripheral vascular disease, autoimmune disease, like complainers, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, and iron deficiencies. The lower labia mucosa appears to be pink with multiple small blood vessels and dots of minor library glands. There appears to be a generalized staining with moderate calculus and plaque deposit on the interproximal surfaces of the mandibular anterior teeth. The free genova appears to be red and inflamed interproximally, while the marginal genova appears to be pale. There is also a lower labial frenum attached to the attached genova of 41. The teeth present in this photograph are 12222 and 34245. An amide infraction can be observed generalized. This is the second intraoral clinical photograph of the patient showing the lips, maxillary and mandibular dentition in occlusion on the right hand side, buccal mucosa, mandibular buccal frenum and gingivite, retracted with the mouth mirror and patient's fingers. There appears to be a generalized staining as well as calculus and plaque deposit on the interproximal surfaces of the mandibular teeth. The free gingiva appears to be red and inflamed. The labia commensal appears to be slightly dry with very small calyces raised vesicle, approximately 5 mm wide. A white diffuse striated lesion, which appears to be central erythematous, is present from 44 to 46 and on the attached interval of this region. The lesion is approximately 15 mm wide with proximal extension into the mucobuckle fold. The lesion appears to be flat or macular and not elevated. The border margin is irregular and not well circumscribed. Lesion shows no thickening at age, likely to be a carotid lesion with epithelial origin, as epithelial hyperplasia and accumulation of keratin tend to produce a white lesion. The teeth present on these photographs are 16221 and 32247. Enema infraction can be also observed generalized. Finally, no prosthesis visible from supplies photographs. Now, I will pass on to Anjali to discuss differential diagnosis. Differential diagnosis. The patient complains of bleeding gingiva and from the clinical examination, it is gathered that the patient's gingiva is in fact inflamed, erythematous and receding. I will be discussing the differential diagnosis for the presenting abnormalities in reference to the gingival condition. Marginal gingivitis. Marginal gingivitis is the inflammation of gingival tissue and is relatively mild and sometimes localized existing around a few or several teeth. It is widely accepted that the most frequent cause of marginal gingivitis is poor oral hygiene. Clinical features that one would observe in patients with this condition include sore, swollen, and bleeding gingival tissue. The patient may also notice a painful reaction or gingival bleeding 
when pressure is lightly applied to the affected area. Another common finding is red, swollen gingiva with the loss of stippling, cuts or abrasions on the gingiva, and heavy plaque and calculus deposits in the affected area. Type 2 early periodontitis. Marginal periodontitis refers to inflammation of the marginal periodontium and is coupled with resorption of the crest of the alveolar bone. The condition is caused by bacteria leading to the destruction of connective tissue and bone, which may result in tooth loss. The disease impacts upon the integrity of tissues such as the crest of the alveolar bone, gingiva, and the periodontal membrane adjacent and above the alveolar crest. In some cases, the marginal periodontium of the entire mouth is affected. In other instances, the disease may be localised to certain regions. To this end, the extent of disease is dependent on the causative agents. Some of the initial signs that present is a loss of uniform coloration and a thickening of the gingival margin due to the inflammation. The crevice, for the most part, is shallow or moderately deep and may encircle the entire tooth or be limited to a single surface. Substantial levels of sub- and supragingival calculus is usually seen and a purulent exudate from the gingival crevice is also apparent in some instances. Further, the gingiva is usually sponge-like and likely to have receded and bleeds easily. In the latter stage of the disease, it is common to notice a bulbous and slightly purple interdental papilla. Furthermore, the food particles may fill the interdental spaces along with calculus, and finally, once the occlusal crown is greater than the root surface, occlusal conditions may cause trauma and lead to tooth mobility. Histologically, there is proliferation of epithelium into the submucosa in finger-like progressions, which frequently anastomose and enclose parts of the inflamed connective tissue. Desquamative gingivitis. Gingival desquamation is a clinical sign in which the gingiva appears reddish and glazed with destruction of the epithelium. The term desquamative gingivitis is a clinical description, not a diagnosis, and in most instances, it involves the whole width of the attached gingiva around a number of teeth. Oral lichen planus accounts for the majority of cases where desquamative gingivitis is observed. When patients present with oral lichen planus, the gingiva usually appears red, smooth, and translucent due to the thinness of the atrophic epithelium. In older patients, mucous membrane pemphigoid, an autoimmune disease characterized by blistering lesions, may cause gingival erosion. Also, pemphigus vulgaris, another autoimmune disease where the body's mucous membranes are attacked, is also another possible cause. Incidentally, desquamative gingivitis is found more commonly in middle-aged to elderly females, which is pertinent to this case, and is said to be an immunologically mediated disease. To confirm the diagnosis, one would require histopathological examination and direct immunofluorescence testing. I will now be passing on to Raymond, who will be discussing the list of differential diagnoses for white lesions. Thanks, Anjali. As described by Harrison, the clinical appearance of the oral lesion is white in color. In consideration of the patient's good systemic and dental health, the differential diagnoses have been devised to include certain liquid platelets. They are as follows. Oral lichen planus, lithedema, hyperkeratosis, oral candidiasis, specifically candidal liquid plachia, also known as chronic hyperplastic candidiasis, carcinoma in situ, and finally oral mucosal squamous cell carcinoma. Oral lichen planus. Oral lichen planus is a chronic inflammatory disease of the oral mucosa. The precise etiology of oral lichen planus remains unclear. It is thought that histologically there is hyperkeratosis or parakeratosis of the epithelial layer, with liquefactive degeneration of the basal cell layer and an increase in lymphocyte infiltrates. 
T-cell lymphocyte, specifically CD4 and CD8 cells, predominate the epithelial mesenchymal junction. Oral lichen planus is more common in females and those over the age of 40. Lesions are usually long-lasting and the gingiva are frequently affected. A patient presents with deformative gingivitis, which is a likely indicator of oral lichen planus. In addition, lichen planus can display lacy, white, raised patches of tissues and are usually bilateral and symmetrical. Nail changes may be a further indication of lichen planus. Leukedema. Leukedema is a generalized bilateral translucent and grayish white thickening of the oral mucosal epithelium. Histopathologically, there is a thickening of the epithelium with intracellular edema of the spinous layer. It is generally recognized as an anatomical variation rather than a pathological process, and its exact cause remains unknown. Leukedema is asymptomatic and often the patient is unaware of it. Most commonly affected sites include the buccal mucosa and the labial mucosa. Leukedema can be smooth on palpation or wrinkled and does not rub off. Another key feature is that the white appearance decreases when the buccal mucosa is stretched. Hypercuritosis. Hypercuritosis is commonly a result of chronic mechanical irritation in the mouth. Histopathologically, the epithelium becomes hyperplastic with an increased thickness in the keratin layer. However, there is no evidence of dysplasia. Etiological factors include abnormally sharp teeth, the presence of foreign objects in the mouth, and aggressive tooth brushing. Clinically, hypercuritosis initially appears as a pale and translucent patch, but progresses to a dense and white rough surface in its later stages. A key feature of hypercuritosis is the resolution of the lesion upon removal of the frictional component. Oral candidiasis. Oral candidiasis is a fungal infection of the oral mucosa caused by the candida species and can appear in many forms. It most frequently presents as a soft, white spot that can develop on any oral mucosal surface. If multiple spots develop, they can eventually coalesce to form larger confluent plants. Among the many types of oral candidiasis is acute pseudomembranous candidiasis, also known as thrush. It can be easily wiped off to expose a red mucosa, which is usually painless. This diagnosis, however, is unlikely when taking into consideration the images described by Harrison, as well as the systemic health and chief complaint presented by the patient. Rather, the lesion is more indicative of chronic hyperplastic candidiasis, which is associated with irregular white plaques that cannot be wiped off. It most commonly affects the post commissural buccal mucosa. First, a more thorough clinical examination is indicated. Carcinoma in situ. Carcinoma in situ is generally described as precancerous neoplastic changes of cells. Risk factors for carcinoma in situ that may be relevant to a patient include advanced age, female gender, and areas of reddening in the lesion. Clinical presentations of a carcinoma in situ typically mimic certain types of leukoplakias, that is, a painless white patch. Commonly affected areas are the lateral borders of the tongue, mucosa adjacent to the alveolar ridge, and floor of the mouth. Histopathologically, carcinoma in situ is recognisable by the presence of high-grade dysplasia in a biopsy. The best predictor of whether carcinoma in situ is likely to evolve into squamous cell carcinoma is the degree of dysplasia seen histologically. Oral mucosal squamous cell carcinoma Finally, Oral mucosal squamous cell carcinoma is a differential diagnosis that must be included for any white lesion of unclear etiology. Every attempt must be made to identify carcinoma in its early stages, since later stage carcinomas is associated with a very poor prognosis. The patient does present with white lesions associated with red areas, but there are no speckled areas, ulcerations, or any enlarged lymph nodes involved. In this case, a biopsy is absolutely essential to rule out any malignancies. I will now pass on to Reem who will discuss further with special tests. Special tests and investigations. Clinical features of the aforementioned differential diagnoses must be correlated with patient history and clinical examination outcomes in order to reach a provisional diagnosis. For us to pursue a specific condition as an explanation for this patient's presenting complaint, 
a more detailed investigation is warranted and further diagnostic testing may be undertaken. Certain fields of the patient history assessment are unknown, and so prior to undertaking any invasive tests, further questioning of the patient may potentially reveal the risk indicators of a suspected condition. In considering the differential diagnosis relating to the inflamed gingiva, full periodontal examination is required to assess pocket depth and periodontal status. Findings will help discern between the list of differential diagnosis for the inflamed gingiva. Radiographs such as bite wings, periapicals and OPG are required to assess periodontal health status and to identify any pathology pertinent to the region of concern. With respect to the white lesion, one must check that the lesion is in fact presenting unilaterally. The area of concern should then be palpated and assessed for tissue friability, exfoliation, soft consistency or induration on palpation. Pain response upon palpation should also be recorded. Any dental res restorations, particularly on the 4-4, 4-5, 4-6 and 4-7 must be noted. This is relevant as polymeric and amalgam restorative materials have been implicated in cases of lichnoid lesions where there's been direct contact between the localised lesion and the restoration. A full blood examination is also needed to determine the presence of any deficiencies and potentially exclude or confirm the presence of immune-mediated disorders. Nutritional deficiencies, abnormal liver functioning and diabetes are contributory to certain cases of oral mucosal lesions, and so it may be necessary to undertake these respective tests. A blood cell count is needed as some immunodeficient patients may have no systemic symptoms yet have deficient lymphocytes. A low lymphocyte and neutrophil count may be indicative of autoimmune disorders. Additionally, a low lymphocyte count is a feature of immunodeficiency caused by hepatitis C infection, and while hepatitis C may be asymptomatic, they complain this is a common manifestation of this infection. Recent restorative treatment or the presence of a defective restoration on either of the teeth in the area of concern may have, been, may have presented a systemic exposure, and so serum compatibility testing for dental materials may be performed. Non-invasive brush biopsy should also be performed as a screening modality to help identify the presence of candidal infection as well as identify hyperkeratotic lesions. The surface smear test also helps to determine if a suspected lesion is precancerous and this ensures that it's diagnosed and treated early. If features of brush biopsy are relatively subtle or incompletely specific, then an incisional biopsy should be performed. To a similar effect, if atypical cells are found, then an incisional biopsy may be indicated. We recognise that a variety of biopsy techniques exist, but in considering our list of differential diagnosis, the most appropriate would be an incisional biopsy. This would be required of the representative area for both pathologic evaluation and to confirm the correct diagnosis. For this patient, a biopsy would not be contraindicated as the lesion does not appear to be vascular and so hemorrhage may be unlikely. If a biopsy is performed, then the patient should be reviewed after one to two weeks to ensure that healing has occurred and to discuss the results of the biopsy. If we were to solely rely on the information presented in the patient history and clinical examination, then through the process of exclusion, a provisional diagnosis may be established. Relevant details pertaining to candidal infection, hyperkeratosis, neoplasia or dysplasia are unknown to us. So in reviewing this case, we know that the reticular ostrea pattern of the white lesion is most comparable to oral lichnoid lesions than any other lesions represented in our list of differential diagnosis. Both onychohorexis, or corrugated nails, and disclamative gingivitis are common presenting features of lichen planus. Thus, the likely provisional diagnosis for this patient may be gingival lichen planus. I will now pass you on to Emil, who will discuss the management strategies for this patient. Thank you, Reem.
Hello Dr. Polano, hello everyone. My name is Emil Fernando and I'm here to talk about management of patients with oral white lesion. Although we have differential diagnosis, it is irrational to focus on a specific provisional diagnosis at this stage due to lack of clinical information on the patient condition. Management of patients with an oral white lesion is highly dependable on the establishment of the correct diagnosis. Once diagnosed, the patient can be treated by a general practitioner, directed for further examination, or referred to a specialist. Health status of the patient, probable prognosis, and available treatment options should be discussed with the patient prior to commencing any treatments. Verbal and written informed consent should be obtained before commencing any procedures, this include biopsies. Implantation can be managed by identifying the level of oral hygiene of the patient, followed by acknowledging the importance of maintaining a high level of regular oral hygiene. This includes introducing flossing and a custom-made toothbrushing technique to the patient, applying tropical fluoride if necessary, providing a trailer-made oral hygiene instruction, promoting healthy dietary habits. Other than these, periodontal screening recording charts can be obtained and appropriate oral hygiene advices can be given according to the patient's scope. Subgingival and supragingival debridement, calculus and plaque removal can be undertaken to improve the level of oral health of the patient. If the lesion is easily rubbed off, then the resulting smear can be examined to identify the cause of the lesion whether it is surface debris or candidiasis. If candida albicans is detected in the smear, then the patient may exhibit immunosuppression status where the patient needs advices of a specialist. Candidiasis causing factors such as salivary gland condition, use of corticosteroid inhalers, poor oral hygiene, bloodborne viral status, and use of medications such as systemic corticosteroids and antibiotics are to be addressed and possible alteration and modification should be discussed with the patient. Short-term use of antifungal therapy, medications such as amphotericin, myconazole, nistatine, along with chlorhexidine mouthwash should be prescribed and proper oral hygiene and danger hygiene should be encouraged for a full resolution of the condition. Management of the disease in an immunosuppressed patient requires specialist advice, where systemic antifungal drugs such as fluconazole and long-term treatments may be indicated. Lipoedema is a condition which does not require specific treatment since there is no malignant potential, but cessation of tobacco products results a considerable decrease in the lesion. However, if there is any doubt about the diagnosis, the patient should be referred to a specialist to undergo for biopsy. Hypercatenosis lesion located on a catenized surface usually resolves when the irritant is removed, therefore no specific treatments are needed. For aggressive cheek and lip biting habits, a psychological evaluation may be appropriate. The patient should be encouraged to eat on a dentate site, if possible, to avoid trauma to the alveolar mucosa during the investigation. The patient should receive follow-up care to ensure the healing of frictional areas. Lesions on non catenized surface are more alarming and should be biopsied if they do not resolve following the removal of the irritant. Plaque formation and associated inflammatory changes can aggregate certain lesion types like lichen planus. Therefore, the patient should be advised of maintaining a high level of oral hygiene. Topical or systemic corticosteroid is the first line of treatment which effectively controls the condition but not cure the painful ulcers of light and planus. Other than that, retinoids are potentially effective but inferior to corticosteroids. Systemic and topical calcineurin inhibitors can be used as an alteration but tarcolimus has been linked with carcinogenic effects and FDA has indicated risks for oral squamous cell carcinoma and lymphoma. Phototherapy is another option of treating lichen planus, although it has an oncogenic potential. If the lesion is not resolved within three weeks, then the patient should refer to an appropriate specialist so that the condition can be managed adequately. Lymph node dissection is performed when lymph nodes are involved. For squamous cell carcinoma, radiation therapy is often used as adjunct to surgery, and chemotherapy is reserved for palliative therapy. Current treatments also include elimination of risk behavior such as smoking, treatment of inflammation, treatment for candidiasis and iron deficiency, medical therapy and excision with mandatory frequent dental disease for observation. Often the main treatment for carcinoma in situ is a complete surgical excision of the lesion by a specialist. If the lesion is able to be removed completely, then the prognosis is good. Although the patient is at increased risk if a new lesion is developing at another side of the oral mucosa. Therefore, monitoring and examining of oral tissues are recommended during the annual dental visits. 
If a biopsy is performed on the patient, then the one to two weeks dental visits should be scheduled post-operatively to ensure an adequate healing process and to discuss the results of the biopsy with the patient. Thank you very much. In conclusion, taking a thorough history is an essential component to find out the possible etiology of the oral lesions. This should always be followed by special investigations and careful assessment to determine multiple possible differential diagnoses. The possible differential diagnoses in relation to patient's symptoms are critically analyzed in order to perform any treatment required. Without collecting all the data and performing each step properly, it will be impossible to determine the diagnosis and therefore unable to perform appropriate treatment. The next slide is our reference list. Thank you.